Good afternoon, everybody. The International Parking and Mobility Institute presents today's sponsored learning lab, Stay Ahead of the Game, Attract EV Drivers and Cost-Effective EV, EV Charging, sponsored by Blink Charging. My name is Justin Grunert, and I'll be assisting Joel Freewa in Blink Charging's learning lab today. As a reminder, today's presentation is being recorded. We will make the recording available within a few days. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping rules for today. All participants' microphones have been muted. We ask you to stay on mute throughout the presentation. For phone participants, please press star six to mute your line. We invite all attendees with a webcam and are comfortable doing so, please turn on your camera. If you have questions for today's speakers, please feel free to queue up a question at any time by typing it into the chat. To access the chat, click on the chat icon in the Zoom menu. A chat window will open. Please type your question in the comments and click send. We will get to as many questions as time allows for. Joel, I'm turning it over to you to introduce our speakers today. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. And uh, thank you to IPMI for, uh, for allowing us this forum today to present to you some uh, creative and cost-effective uh, solutions for uh, EV charging for the parking industry. Uh, joining me today, uh, well, first off, I'm sorry, uh, I'm Joel Frewa. I am uh, one of the marketing managers here at Blink Charging. Joining me today is our VP of Grant, and Oper of Grant Operations, David Sowens. And also a very special thank you to Reef Parking's Executive Vice President, Isaiah, Isaiah Mao. Hope I said that correctly, Isaiah. Um, as Reef uh, is one of our partners, uh, location partners, and they'll be joining us today to share with you some of the experience that they've had working with us in, uh, in the EV charging space. Uh, Justin, I do believe we have a poll question queued up. If we can bring that up. We'd like to start with a quick poll question for everybody. Uh, and you see the poll right there in front of you. Which of the following best describes your area of practice in parking? Uh, we have quite a few categories there from university, municipal, event, consultant, airport, et cetera. So, if you can please take that, that's just so we can gauge uh, which, uh, which industries are attending today and, uh, and what we need to address uh, more or less. So we'll give that a few more seconds. And I think that, okay, I think we can end it there. Uh, okay, so a lot of university folks here today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, some airport folks and municipal as well, as well as commercial. Uh, so thank you very much all for joining us. And um, let's get started with, uh, with the big, good content. So first off, uh, we want you to know that EVs are not a fad and they are absolutely coming our way. They are barreling down the, down the train tracks here. They're going to be coming very, very quickly. As you can see right there on your screen, uh, 100 additional electric vehicle models will be brought to market by 2024. And that doesn't just include Tesla, that includes brands like Ford uh, just announced their brand new all electric F-150. They also just launched the Mustang. You have br uh, big major brands like Cadillac and Jaguar announcing that their entire lineups will be all electric by 2025. Uh, you also have um, startup brands like Rivian or Lucid. Uh, as well as you know, Chevy, even Harley Davidson, the motorcycle brand is launching uh, electric motorcycles now. Uh, so <clears throat> EVs are gonna become the norm slowly throughout the decade. And we believe here at Blink that we are gonna reach a critical mass of EV adoption very, very soon. As EVs become more common, obviously more charging stations will be required. And these won't come in the form of our traditional gas stations. People are gonna wanna charge where they're already parking whether that's at school, uh, multifamily, <clears throat> excuse me, multifamily apartment buildings, uh, at the workplace. Uh, there's a million different places where people park their cars for extended periods, uh, be it a grocery store. And you see right there, the increases are just exponential as the decade moves down the line. So let's get into some, uh, actually, no, we have another two poll questions for you uh, so we can keep gauging the the audience that we have with us today. Uh, Justin, if you can launch those for us.
All right. And then we'll move to poll number two. So do you currently offer EV charging at your location? Very simple. If you do, hit yes. If you don't, please hit no. And the second question is, how familiar are you with EVs and EV charging? Uh, from You can rank it from one to five, one being not familiar at, uh, at all, and five being very familiar. So we'll give that a few seconds for, uh, for everybody to uh, get their votes in. Oh, so that's a very good uh, encouraging answer I'm seeing. Let's uh, go ahead and end the poll. And you see 72% of our audience already offers EV charging. That's, that's great to hear. And you know, EV adoption is, is something that is coming faster than, well, let's just say very fast. And uh, this audience is somewhat familiar with EV charging. So that gives us a leg up. We can start getting into the content here. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, there are three levels of EV charging. I'm gonna share the results of the poll there. So for anybody who's not familiar, there are three levels of EV charging, uh, and I'm gonna break these down as simple as I can. Level one, quite simple, every EV comes with a charging cord, and you can also get these charging cords on Amazon. That's what level one is. You're gonna take your cord, plug it into your car, plug it into an outlet in your home, much like you do a cell phone. Uh, these chargers are slow, and if you have the right vehicle, uh, you maybe will be able to charge overnight, but they charge very, very slow. They are actually called trickle chargers in some cases. You have level two charging, which is uh, one of our main products here at Blink. This is actually the most uh, widely adopted um, level of charging for public charging at the moment. Uh, you see right there, you can get between 40 to 65 miles uh, of charge per hour. That obviously depends on the car and the level of electrical infrastructure at your location. Uh, it, uh, level two charging has a universal plug, which is a J1772 there. Tesla also has their, um, their proprietary plug, though there are adapters. Uh, at least a blink, every charger that we offer works with any EV on the market, even the Tesla ones with a Tesla adapter that comes with every Tesla. And then you have DC fast charging, which is much more for highway corridors. They're much more costly, but they can charge a battery 80% uh, of the way uh, in as little as 30 minutes, sometimes uh, less depending on the vehicle. And, and that also you see three plug types there, the CSS combo plug. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It actually uh, mimics the J1772 universal plug. So those two plugs go hand in hand. The Chatmo plug is an older plug that's actually being phased out. And the Tesla plugs work, uh, their proprietary plugs work exactly the same way. As we go along, folks, this is a lot of information. If you have any questions, just put it into the chat and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to address them as quickly as possible. Uh, actually, if possible, Justin, I'd like to address the questions at the end, if we can do that. Uh, yeah, so me too, yes. Yeah, I'll keep a log of the chat there. I'll take a look at it. All right, so uh, when you start shopping around or looking into EV charging, you're gonna hear the term network charger. Uh, so some quick advantages, of or differences between network and non-network chargers are obviously you see right on your screen payment collecting. Uh, this essentially connects the chargers to the cloud. Blink, we have our own network for our chargers where all of our chargers are interconnected. You as the host location are able to log in, see the chargers, uh, the level of activity and usage they're getting, which chargers are available, which may be in need of, uh, of service. It also allows for things like payment processing, third-party map integration that will, uh, being on the Blink network will get your location shown on Google Maps or Apple Maps or third-party applications like PlugShare. It'll get you shown as an EV charging destination. So that's always a perk that always attracts EV drivers to your location. You can, uh, let's say you're running multiple parking garages, you can delegate the management of the chargers at any one parking garage to the one parking manager that you have at that location. Uh, you can remote troubleshoot. It also allows us, Blink, if you do need service on those chargers to remotely log in and see what exactly is going on with that charger. So there are several advantages to having a network charger versus a non-network charger, which essentially will just allow the user to plug in and charge. 
A uh, quick little bit about Blink and the products that we offer. I don't want to make this too salesy. We want to uh, get you guys to the meat and potatoes of the presentation. But just so you're aware of who we are and what we offer, we've been in the EV charging uh, industry for over 10 years, well, for over a decade. And right here, you see some of our products. We have the new HQ150, which is a level two home charger that you can have installed in your home. We have the industry leading IQ200 uh, level two charger. This is the most powerful level two charger on the market today. We also have a portable level two charger, which is for emergency use uh, for folks who maybe run out of charge and need those last few miles just to get to the next charging station. Uh, there's a lot of roadside assistance applications, but some parking units do have those on hand. And then of course we have our DC fast charging products for uh, highway corridors, or uh, larger uh, stops, and David's going to touch on this uh, quite a bit in a little while. In a little while. So, uh, as I mentioned, the Blink IQ two hundred is the fast. It's an eighty amp level two EV charging, and eighty amps, by the way, is the max. This is a future proof product. There's no obsolescence built into this product. You will you won't need an upgrade for this product as a level two charger. Um, it is network connected, it tracks energy usage and handles all the billing. You can have up to 20 uh, EV chargers connected through one kiosk location. So you can centralize payment in one location of your, of your parking uh, structure while having 20 chargers uh, spread out throughout your, uh, your location as well. Uh, it's got all the technical specifications down there, the Blinko CPP uh, protocols, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That just has to do with the, uh, the network and its compatibility with other chargers. Uh, and it, of course it accepts uh, things like Apple Pay, Google Wallet and RFID payments. If you do wanna know more about these, uh, we will give out our contact information here at the end and you will get a follow on email from us at Blink with all of this information in case you, uh, you're interested in uh, learning more. Of course, there's also the Blink network, which as I mentioned earlier, it streams it streamlines the payment processing uh, gets you listed on Google Maps, Apple Maps as an EV charging destination, as well as PlugShare, uh, which is one of the most popular apps with uh, EV drivers there for, um, for locating charging stations. Uh, it also allows you to log in and really drill down for, uh, on all the charging data for sustainability reporting or any kind of, uh, you can actually use a lot of this data for marketing. Uh, so the, the Blink Network is really a cloud-based robust platform uh, and it actually is built with uh, secondary backup systems that are geographically separated in case of any disasters, natural disasters, God forbid. Uh, that that is always there and will always be able to be recovered. And we also work with several uh, business models and this will get into the flexibility of that cost effectiveness of, that we're gonna talk about in a little while. Uh, depending on your location, you can own the chargers, you can buy them outright and just run them yourself. Uh, you can uh, hire Blink as a subscription service, or uh, we can enter into a hybrid agreement, and we'll touch on those here a little bit more in a little bit. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Isaiah, who's going to tell us a little bit about Reef and about how they've uh, implemented EV charging into their locations. Isaiah, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. Good. Thank you, Joel. Thank you to uh, listeners for listening in and IPMI for hosting and Blink. Uh, they've been a fantastic partner. I encourage all of you to, to reach out to them. We'll provide the contact information. Um, they do have a few more slides after this. David's going to talk about um, how you can use grants to implement uh, EV charging with some other great stuff. So uh, before that, I was asked to tell a case story, tell a story um, about the relationship with Reef and Blink. So I work for Reef and I have to give some background so I can explain why the relationship with Blink has been very important to us. So Reef was formed in 2019 with the mission of creating urban ecosystems to connect the world to your block. So that's a lot. You know, you, uh, you, you're familiar with software as a service. You may have heard of mobility as a service. Uh, we like the term prox proximity as a service. Uh, I define that as amenities or technologies that are made more valuable due to convenient proximity consumed as a service. So as the world becomes more automated and connected, proximity is very important. You know, Amazon, two-day shipping, may want to get to 30-minute shipping or one-day shipping, and having proximity will help them do that. 
Uh, so one way we use proximity as a service was by reimagining the parking real estate. So Reef acquired several national parking companies, including Impark, uh, Republic Parking, Lanier Parking, Ameripark, Citizens Parking, PK1 Parking, and several others uh, to create this network of 5,000 parking locations uh, spread out in practically every town in America. Uh, why is that important? Because for 100 years, we've done nothing with parking other than uh, one thing, park vehicles. But as COVID has shifted where and how we work uh, with the advent of autonomous vehicles on the horizon, um, we had to start thinking about how we can use parking for more than just parking a car. Uh, so we've done things like putting in Amazon lockers or bicycle sharing or cloud kitchens, mobility hubs, and EV charging with uh, relationship with Blink. Um, so fast forward now, Reef has partnered with Blink uh, to use our real estate network to provide EV charging for our customers. So you can go to the next slide. Now we have over 150 Blink EV charging stations across 24 cities, and we expect that to grow. So our goal is that when a customer is driving and they're on the plug share app or Reef uh, or the, the Blink app, um, we want them, if they see a Reef sign, they know that's a mobility hub. I can go and charge my EV based on our relationship and partnership with Blink. Uh, so that's one reason uh, why this is very important for us. Another reason this is important for us is this has helped our company and probably helped some of you on this call uh, get accredited or get certifications. For example, IPMI has an APO, accredited parking organization. Rachel's on the call. She's This is a she helps uh, champion this effort, but it's a way to recognize parking operations that go above and beyond and that meet a standard of excellence. And you can earn points by having EV charging. We also earned points uh, for some of our ParkSmart certified garages. So ParkSmart is kind of the lead equivalent uh, for parking garages as lead is to buildings. And you can get points for having blink charging stations in your facilities. Um, but more important than that, the recognition and the marketing and the advertisement is uh, what this can do for you as asset owners and landlords and parking operators. Uh, so number one, revenue. You can charge uh, for, you can charge your customers for using uh, EV charging, for using the Blink charging stations, and that's revenue you can put back into your operation. Um, you, can, um, you can charge a reserved space for a dedicated reserved EV charging. So for someone that owns a certain vehicle that needs an EV charging every day, they have a long commute, you can charge a lot of money for that premium reserved parking space. Um, you can also, of course, roll this into your monthly charge just by adding that additional amenity. But at the end of the day, when there's a customer deciding between parking garage A and parking garage B, uh, having that EV charging, having that Blink station, it's going to help put more customers into your facilities. Great, thank you for that, Isaiah. Um, yeah, we've has been. So, so, that was, that was, so just again, just uh, a little bit. It's been very important to us to help meet our goals. It's found. I sorry, I missed that one slide where it talked about. We have found it increases our real estate value by two or three percent by um, there in the green. I meant to point that out by having that in our facilities. But just can't say enough how great. Uh, Blink has been as a partner and uh, look forward to continuing the relationship. Thanks, Jill. Oh, we agree. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you for joining us today. And we look, uh, we're going to get some more cool information from you here in a minute. Uh, all right. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, David. He's going to tell us a little bit about incentives for EV charging. And this means there are, well, he'll tell you, there's a million incentives out there for you to be able to uh, EV charging. David, take it away. Yes, hello. Thank you, everybody. Joel, Isaiah, thank you. IPMI also. Um, so Dave Soans, Vice President of Grant Operations at Blink. Uh, wanted to talk about uh, and give you guys an overview of, of what the landscape looks like in, in the United States for, for grants and rebates. Uh, I, I won't go into high detail on the tax credits, but, um, but uh, we can... We, if you have further layers of detail that you'd like to get on that, we can help you with that as well from our finance team. Uh, so Blink utilizes uh, several different streams of, 
of grant opportunities uh, to capitalize on the growth of, of our portfolio here in the United States. And we, we utilize local opportunities through RFPs that municipalities will put out for, for public parking access for EV drivers. They also like to incorporate uh, fleet services into some of the public parking opportunities. So they're willing to, to help us create what we call make ready funds. And what make ready funds are usually supported by is the utility company. And the utility company has, you know, costs embedded into infrastructure build out as well. So they have to, they have to make sure that the grid is going to be, you know, sustained and it's going to operate properly among the parameters that they need it to. If they can't, they have to do these upgrades and sometimes they're very expensive. So um, certain entities that want to, want to get, EV growth into their communities uh, to, to reduce fossil fuel emissions, uh, to create uh, or to keep up even with the trends of EV transportation growth, as Joel has pointed out earlier in the earlier slide and what the growth projections look like for 18%, certain upgrades have to be made and certain investments have to be made. So um, with that being said, that helps us grow, grow our portfolio. Moving on, there's some state opportunities that are created through diesel mitigation programs. Um, they're also created through, through highway transportation um, programs as well, where the states have designated corridors on, on, you know, that have been uh, identified by the federal government and the Department of Transportation, where they see a need to have alternative fuel you know, measures taken to, to grow on on the EV infrastructure build out on America's highways. So we participate in state grant opportunities to do that. And we've been successful in states like Vermont and Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, you know, going across the whole, the whole country there um, in Michigan as well with developing DC fast charging infrastructure for those particular grants that are looking to have these corridors filled with, with adequate infrastructure for EV drivers that want to you know, travel on interstates on, and the highways. And sometimes we can, be, we can capture 80% of the cost of a project you know, to do that. So um, that's the most ideal scenarios. Sometimes it's a 50-50, but we work with C-store operators, we work with hotel owners, we work with municipalities, uh, many different opportunities with the site hosts to explore and, and build out that infrastructure. And then, you know, obviously with the state's help, we can, we can do that. Uh, the DC fast charging space is very expensive. It's capital intensive and uh, it's very helpful to, to utilize those funds in order to, to grow out, grow out a portfolio of DC fast charging across the country. Um, so federal Federal grants also. Um, I think with the new Biden administration, we're gonna see a lot of investment coming out of the Department of Energy. We're gonna see a lot of investment coming out of the, uh, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Interior as well. It will have a hand in this. We'll see a lot of collaboration to build out through different grant opportunities, uh, not only on highways, but in rural communities and uh, rural states that have you know, smaller populations and have a need to supply infrastructure across the, uh, the United States. So we'll also be participating in those programs as they become available. We've also um, been, I wouldn't say, I can't, I can't say there's, there's uh, disclosure stuff, but there's some projects that we are working on that are, are federally funded and I can't, say where they're at, but there are projects that we're working on that have uh, the green light to go forward on and uh, the working through the federal you know, programs to do that. It's been a, a very, very good uh, and aggressive uh, measure and tactic that's been developed through those agencies that I mentioned. And it's going to be, you know, it's been a good thing 
to reduce the, you know, the carbon emissions in the United States. So we, we feel like, you know, the money's going to be spent well to help develop this. As, as Joel mentioned earlier, there's so much massive investment in the, in the um, uh, OEM space where they're developing, you know, 30, 40, 50, you know, hundred billion dollar investments from the OEMs into their product portfolio of, of vehicles that they're going to develop. And I just saw that, you know, Daimler Mercedes has a whole fleet of electric trucks that they're launching with up to 250 plus miles of range for, for uh, intermodal transportation, for um, yard movement, for, you know, um, city, city LTL. So all of that bigger fleet opportunity growth is also going to be, going to be developed with with more with bigger class size vehicles as well so it's not just the cars and the motorcycles we're, we're talking about anymore now we're talking about major investment from from smaller companies that do deliveries and also do transportation services for for parcel goods that will that will just continue to grow so um there, those, there's a long road ahead of, of a lot of investment that has to be made. Yeah, there's even some uh, uh, some school districts in California already that have fully electric uh, school buses. School buses. Mm-hmm. Uh, David, I'm wondering if you can pro- maybe uh, give the folks a little bit of clarity on how the process works for these grants. Uh, let's forget about the federal tax credit for a minute and talk about mainly about the state grants, local grants, because. Uh, on the map, obviously we have some states covered, but those are just a few examples of what's available. A lot of these grants are available at the county level. They're available through the uh, utility companies, not necessarily always with the state. For example, I know Sacramento County in California uh, has a $6,500 rebate per, uh, per two charging ports. That That's correct. In New York, the, the requirements are a little bit different. I know, for example, in Arkansas, you have to deploy the chargers first and then send them actually a picture of it. And then they'll send you the funds. Sometimes you get the funds in the head. So can you maybe touch a little bit about how folks can navigate that? Yeah. So, so absolutely, Joel, thank you for bringing that up. So for, for, for interested parties that want to explore getting uh, programs for, you know, for the charging stations and reimbursement. A lot of the utility programs and state programs um, offer, offer a credit to, you know, a, a cash rebate back uh, towards the cost of the, you know, installation and the product or both uh, in some cases. And if you have a site that is deemed a viable location for, for, um, charging station infrastructure, you can, you can apply through the program. It's usually a pretty simple application and describe the address, describe uh, the utility service, um, maybe just have an electric account number for the utility. And then uh, the site will be evaluated for approval uh, for that, for that charging station. And in some cases, it's a small rebate as little as like $500. And in other cases, it can be $2,500 or $5,000 or higher towards the installation of a, of a level two charging station or multiple charging stations. And yep. once, once that's done, it's usually done by reimbursement. Um, so after you have gotten approval and you coordinate with the charging station company like Blink, we will commission the charger for you. We'll help you with the installation process and we'll also help you with the reimbursement process as well. Now we're not allowed to go in and do it all for you, but we can help you with with the questions that you might find confusing and uh, allow you to, to navigate the system to be credited properly. So we have done that in several cases. Uh, where we have had customers at hotels um, that have qualified for for these charging stations um, and have have a you know a need to be reimbursed in the proper way. So um, multiple layers of of opportunities are out there, not only from the utilities but from the states as well, mm-hmm. as Joel has mentioned. 
Yeah, if you want to find out exactly what's available in your area, you see our uh, sales email right there. You can email us right there. Just simply ask us what's available in my area. And one of our, our folks will be glad to look into that for you and get you the answers that you're looking for. You can also go on our website, glimcharging.com. We do have an incentive, commercial incentives page. Right there, you can just click on your state and everything that's available will pop up. But like I said earlier, these are just uh, a few that you see on the map. I know, for example, Florida's about to come out with some stuff. I know Michigan has some, Arizona's about to come out with some other, some stuff as well. Um, so, you know, when you really take advantage of these things and you look at our business models, it's not uncommon to get level two EV charging stations at a location for little to even no cost at some, in some cases. Um, Isaiah, I was wondering if you could help us understand a little bit the where parking is actually going, not just as it relates to EV charging, but uh, the entire e-mobility, micro-mobility uh, kind of movement or, or industry that's popping up around huge parking centers in cities, where you mentioned earlier, maybe you'll have a million different services available now, maybe city bikes or scooters and EV charging and other, other different things. What are you guys seeing uh, on that level over at REIT? Sure. So uh, that's one of the, the trends we're seeing is alternate cases, alternate uses. So using parking to host or to house the ghost kitchens, cloud kitchens, or to park. Uh, a lot of stories like, um, especially during COVID, where, for example, the 49ers, uh, Candlestick Stadium, their parking lot sat empty for a whole year. So they partnered with some of the rental car agencies because their cars are grounded and people aren't using them. So they had to store thousands of, of, uh, of rental cars. So they did that. Um, with, with COVID, um, we're starting to bounce back. So that's a positive trend where, um, you know, maybe not as many people or, you know, you've all heard this, maybe not as many people are, are going back into the office. Um, uh, but those that are, Maybe in the past they used to take mass transit, but now they want to be alone in their car, not carpooling because of the virus. Uh, so we're still seeing people, well, we're starting to see our monthly parking trickle up. You know, that was where most of the cities I worked with took the biggest hit was mar monthly parking uh, declining. So it's positive to see that monthly parking starting to come back up. Uh, another trend is, is, you know, there's still some demand issues where in certain cities they, we still need more parking or they did before COVID and they expect that um, as the world returns to normal. So uh, they're designing their garages with, uh, with the bones in place so it can be converted into something else. Maybe it's a, a garage that has a lot of, um, has all the structure built. So for water and, and, and gas and electric so that it can be changed into apartments or condos in, in the future. So they're thinking in that way, that's a trend um, touchless, frictionless. So that's another trend where people are more and more on your, uh, on your phone. So trying to come up with solutions to uh, pay for parking to, uh, with your phone to not have to touch things, to wave, to get a ticket instead of having to push a button, um, removing gates when access isn't needed has been a trend frictionless gate list. Um, I'm all over the place. I, I don't have the magic ball as far as when the autonomous uh, vehicles um, will really see a big decline in, 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 in parking. I think all of us are, now that we're bouncing back, I think those that, you know, provide the, the COVID you know, uh, companies that, that made it through are only gonna see it up and up. And uh, we're gonna be needing parking professionals for, for many years. I kind of bounced everywhere because we didn't prescript this, but I hope I, I, That's all right. I covered enough. But, and you saw in your earlier slides out EV charging is, is on the rise and expect big things by 2024. So that's another trend where having a lot of my clients talk to me about, should I charge for EV? Should I get EV charging? Those kind of questions. And so it's another trend. No, thank you for that. It's always good to know where the industry is going, even if not in the context of EV charging. All right, so let's go ahead and get to some questions. Uh, this is my favorite part of webinars. It's always more interactive and 
we get to talk to some of you. So, um, David, a first question that came in is, can you address how affordable housing development, how an affordable housing development can provide cost-effective EV charging to meet CD mandates, for example, Atlanta or St. Louis, uh, for new development? A major demographic of which people are at risk of homelessness, who would be unlikely to own EV? So how, how do we, how can we work with uh, developments that have city mandates, uh, you know, navigate this whole um, city mandate type of thing? Right. So one of the methods of navigating that has been, has been partnering with, with ride share and car share groups. We have our own operation of Blue LA that we, that we work with the community on offering transportation solutions for, for drivers that can't afford a car. And we also have incentives through different utility and state rebates that we, that we exercise with, with regards to developing the infrastructure to support those programs. So um, there's even cases of municipal um, you know, transportation where they might not necessarily truly need to service that area with, um, with EVSC, but they do want to service that area for public transport. And as the landscape of technology evolves for, for transportation and electrification, they want to make sure that there's redundancy in the system for those charging stations to be placed in those areas. So um, we will develop charging infrastructure in uh, distressed communities where it's necessary for, for the community to be served um, and where it will be necessary to have that infrastructure and to incorporate um, those types of programs to build that infrastructure in. Um, so we're, we're going to see, you know, as we, you know, we talked about, Isaiah mentioned autonomous driving and what's happening with that. So I think we're still quite a bit of ways from that really truly happening and the way that we envision it. But um, at some point in the future, it will come to fruition. But for the time being, you know, there's going to be still, you know, people behind the steering wheel and, and doing their thing. And, and they will be driving a, a highly advanced vehicle. But I definitely see that the, the car share and mobility, you know, landscape changing a little bit as the technology gets better and better. And I think that we'll be able to provide, you know, affordable solutions uh, for, for people in, in those types of communities where they need, they need to, to get around absolutely through, through these, through the grants and through the um, partnerships that we develop with the, with transportation fleet companies, including taxi cab fleets. Yeah, no, I think Blue LA is a, it's a great example. Uh, it's actually good mobility. Uh, what it is, is essentially we have 60 EV charging locations throughout the city of Los Angeles, and we have cars at these locations that people can rent at a very, very low cost. It's a fully electric vehicle. They walk in, they open it with their phone, they go where they need to, they come back. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of creative creativity out there uh, in the industry, I think. Uh, so thank you for that, David. Uh, let's see, uh, Justin, can you help me navigate the questions here a little bit? Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, what was that again, Joel? No, if you can help me navigate the questions here. Uh, I see a lot in the chat. There's a lot of messaging back and forth. Sure. Um, the next question actually was about um, level three charging. Mm -hmm. um, could you go ahead and explain a little bit more about the level three charging? Um, the Jeff who asked the question, he has a good understanding of level two, but more as um, getting started to ask for level three equipment begins to evolve, begins to balloon. Uh, to balloon. Well, uh, level three is what's called DCFC or DC fast charging. Uh, the DC stands for direct current. It's a whole different electrical setup. Dave's actually one of our experts on DC fast. So I'm going to let him tell us what uh, the real difference is between DC fast and level two. Besides the obvious, the speed factor, DC fast, we know it's much uh, faster. 
but there's also the cost factor. DCFast is far more expensive to, uh, to install and operate. So David, can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, um, and it, it's a rather broad question. Um, so I, I don't want to take a tremendous chunk of time to go through um, the education process about it, but I will say some, you know, uh, I'll cover some bullets and broad strokes about it. Um, as Joel has mentioned, it is a different um, setup, the way the, the vehicle receives the power um, direct into the battery. So your car is designed with an, an AC um, system that converts power to go into your batteries from alternating current into direct current. And the cars have a a, a power module inside it that switches the current over. And they're usually capped at certain sizes of electricity to go or amounts of electricity to go into the car. So you're, if you buy, you know, a, uh, a Chevy, you know, bolt, I think that as like a 6.6 .6 kilowatt inverter that converts that current into the battery pack at 6.6 .6 kW. And, now they're building out more and more vehicles that go up to 10, 11, um, 18, and 19 kilowatt conversion processes. But the DC system works by going direct, bypassing that system internally and going straight into the battery. So um, we have 50 kilowatt chargers. We have 175 kilowatt chargers, 75 kilowatt chargers. And now the marketplace is growing into 350 kilowatt chargers. And what's that mean is, is that a massive amount of electricity can be harnessed from the grid through the transformers into our charging station and then pushed into the vehicle uh, through the same type of, gateway system that we do on the L2 chargers that you see on the screen. But the power delivery is done through a bigger cord and a bigger system because it's obviously more power. Those um, chargers are going to allow for mass adoption of electric vehicles because what it, it, it does is it creates an anomalous situ situation where a person that's used to charging their vehicle at a gas station, or I'm sorry, fueling their vehicle at a gas station in six to seven minutes uh, at a site visit at a C-store. Um, that nature is, is a, it's a lot longer of a process when you charge an electric vehicle currently. But now that we have fast charging infrastructure being developed and utilized, it's just getting better and better. And so you'll start to see a more of an acceptance and, and a threshold of more and more people saying, oh, I'd be willing to drive an electric car now that there's more and more infrastructure that can charge your car quicker. Because even though I charged my car overnight, like you do your cell phone or, at a, or when you park at Reef for your you know, parking lot experience and over a longer duration of time, um, some people also want the convenience of quick charging when they go on a destination trip, or if they have to go on the highway to visit family, they wanna have that ability to fast charge their vehicle. Right. We also see a need for it in some urban community situations and in some multifamily situations as well. Whereas we don't have a lot of room to develop fast uh, level two charging banks. That, that's what I wanted to get to. I, I think there's something about the practicality of DC fast charging where I hate to put it this way, but it's kind of overkill for some situations, whether it's in the size of the actual units or let's say somebody's going to be parked at a location for four or five hours while they say go to school or, or they're at work. Maybe they don't need that DC fast charging. That's correct. You don't need it in a lot of cases, but in some cases where there is um, a, a large amount of population in a small area and there's not enough parking space available for a lot of level two parking, then the fast charging can make sense in those scenarios. Mm -hmm. And in those scenarios, um, you can have people, you know, sharing the charging station. We have developed sites where they're in dense urban communities and they just want to the convenience of even though they have a 100, and 100 kilowatt battery pack and it can go several days. They just need the convenience of going and putting 15 minutes or 20 minutes of time in at the DC fast charger 
they do that and they're good for three or four days because uh, they don't travel a lot. But that that is something that is evolving. And each each city and each urban area um, will have different needs. And uh, we try to figure out a solution for everybody. Great. Thank you for that, David. Uh, all right. Let's uh, move on to the next question here. <clears throat> Justin, I believe it's from Anu, next question. I don't want to skip anybody. Correct, correct. Um, he has two questions. I'll read the first part. Do most EV charging companies offer project management consulting services, or is that something you would recommend we get separately? And then the other question is, uh, what type of chargers are used most, garage or surface lots, and why? Uh, Anu, I'm actually going to ask you to uh, clarify your first question. When you say management and consulting services, are you speaking specifically about uh, EV, EV charging or are you speaking about something else? Um, if it's as far as the EV stations themselves, I'm sorry? Yeah, so what I was uh, referring to was really the, um, yeah, the EV chargers themselves. So if, if we were wanting to look to get, you know, 200, as an example, chargers, would, you know, uh, would there be somebody that would offer project management services or should we be getting one on our own? Because um, obviously to get 200 charges in a city can be a, a big job. Of course, uh, uh, David, and I think you can probably speak to this a little bit better than I can, but I will say uh, there will have to be uh, electrical contractors uh, involved uh, when it comes to the make ready uh, portion of that. But I do believe, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, that we can absolutely help with that. Yeah, we have a, um, we have a construction department at Blink, and we also have a highly educated team of advisors that could, could look at the situation that you guys have to a solution that you guys want to present to us to to offer our suggestions, uh, we can we can handle that from you know the sales perspective, where you'll get a good overview of the technology, the hardware, what's available, and then also we also have a team that we can focus on the viability of the project and whether or not um, we would have to consult with the utility company to do upgrades to allow for that size of a system to be developed. And then we can also coordinate that in-house with our construction department to, to have the right, the right qualified engineering teams and civil engineering teams, and then also electricians that are qualified to, to do the installation process for you. So um, we do have a turnkey solution in-house that we can offer and some a, a certain level of consulting services. Um, if, if necessary, we could also help you with that. Great, thank you, David. Uh, and sorry, Anu, the second part of your question was, I actually don't see it written in the chat. Um, it's the, uh, what type of chargers are most used, garages or surface lots? And why? Well, um, I think at uh, garages or surface lots, I think the most common type of charger you're going to have used is a uh, level two charger. Uh, uh, Isaiah, you can speak to this. I don't know. You guys are reef. Uh, I think all of our locations with you guys are level two chargers. So uh, yeah, you want people to spend as people are going to spend as much time at the uh, at the parking garage or parking lot as as possible, so you want, you don't have to have a, a DC fast charger. It's a much more uh, expansive and expensive infrastructure project, correct? But I guess my question is more so location-wise. So if we're just starting out getting a number of chargers out there, would you say that um, because the chargers are more visible on surface lots that they're used more? Or I know from a expense factor that garages would be less expensive from infrastructure because they've already got power. Um, and so uh, we're, just, we're trying to balance out surface versus garage as far as where to put them. Uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, I say, I don't know if you have any insight you can offer here. Yeah, I will say that the majority of ours are in the garage um, 
like I said, they're level two, so people are parking longer. We want them protected from the elements so that there's, if it's raining, snowing, in the sun, whatever, that's just a better experience when it's covered. We do have some lots, even here in my hometown of Chattanooga, that are covered with solar panels, actually, but they have a roof and there's charging stations underneath them. I don't know which which ones market better. You know, you think the, the lots, they're more visible. You're driving by, oh, they do EV charging. Um, I've even seen uh, some of our cities do on-street parking. So at the meters, those kind of spaces, they offer EV charging. So those are very marketable. Um, so I'm not sure. I would think that a lot would be more visible. Um, but as far as more convenient, more practical, it's always been the parking garages because also, like you said, it's easier to for the infrastructure since you already have power, lighting, security cameras, um, security, maybe someone in a booth that can watch it. So there's just a, we've always preferred in the garages, but that's a great question. So I'd be awesome. curious if any of our listeners have them in lots and garages and what they see from their markets. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, one of the good things about uh, the Blink uh, kiosk style deployment is that you can have up to 20 chargers in different locations, all managed uh, from one central location or what have one payment gateway. So you can put chargers in your surface lot and a few inside your garage and have them all come together in one central location and all manageable from one platform. So that is doable as well. Yeah, one one more point, Joel. That's a very that's a very good detail that you pointed out. But there's one more point. It's all it's all about the also the geography and and servicing the consumer as well. So in some cases, you just won't have the option, right? It, it's it's just only going to be a surface lot that's available within two or three blocks or a parking garage structure that's available. So depending on the geography. Um, is is a is a big component in that decision as well yeah so there's a lot that goes into the answer Anu. Uh, i'm gonna go ahead we're gonna drop our contact information here at the end uh justin i don't know if we can send an email to everybody with that after uh, if not we'll we'll figure it yep. out uh get in touch with us and we'll get in touch with you and we'll get somebody that that uh, can really take a look at your project and answer all of your questions for that so I think the next question, Justin, comes to us from, I'm not sure. Uh, it's from Kevin White. And can you talk about the approaches or model of who pays for the electricity for the use of EV chargers once they are installed public in publicly accessible locations? Okay, so this is where the beauty of Blink kind of comes through. I'm gonna switch back to our business model slide. And we are unique in that we have several different ways uh, that we can operate. You can have a completely host owned model where you own the charger, you're gonna pay for your electricity, but you, at the same time, you're gonna charge whatever you want for that electricity, for that EV uh, to, ch uh, to charge the vehicle. Uh, or you can get, uh, if you get a, a hybrid owned um, agreement with Blink, um, it, it varies agreement by agreement, but there is a way that, that uh, Blink will actually reimburse you for the electricity. So go ahead and go to our website, take a look at, uh, more in depth at all these business models. I think the answer really lies there. Uh, what do you think, David? Yes. Um, so as as Joel mentioned, there's several several business cases that we can discuss with the customer on what they're comfortable with and how they want to interact with Blink on, on that basis. Of, of, of investment, if they want it to be our investment and we do a revenue share, we can do that. If we want to do like a hybrid situation where they might have some investment into the site where the condo is there and it's, it's ready, uh, the, their, um, their panel is ready to accept the power, we can, we can do a, sort of a, a hybrid business arrangement with them on, on what that will look like will be determined uh, through a site evaluation. And then in other cases, we could, you know, as Joel mentioned, we went through the slide, you know, other investments we can do. So he's, he's right. We, we can evaluate this uh, on, on the opportunity at hand. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to vary case by case. Um, okay. 
All right, next we have, I believe it's Jeff again, uh, Justin. Actually, the next question is from Arizona University. Mm -hmm. um, this will be the last question that we have time for for today. Um, any other questions we will, we will send to them and we will, we will get your answered offline. Absolutely. Um, but the question is, will the increased power dump from the level three DC fast charger create more heat than most EV vehicles can manage? I'm going to throw that question to David. Yeah. So obviously the more power, the more heat. So there is thermal management going on when uh, a car is being charged. So the, the internal um, cooling system of the DC charger has um, a, a heat exchange system uh, built into it where the cables are liquid cooled. And then there's a heat exchange system internally that, that cools down uh, the fluid as it sucks and it sucks the heat off of the, off the cores as it's pushed into the vehicle. The vehicles are also designed with thermal management systems on the battery. So they operate at the temperature uh, parameters that the cars and the battery system is designed to be in. So if it gets too hot, the car will automatically turn on its, its, its um, thermal management system to cool down the batteries. Uh, through through the you know engineered and designed systems that the that the manufacturer of the vehicle has has put into motion on that on that type of vehicle, um, some of the older designs like the, I think the Nissan Leaf's original Leaf did not have a thermal management system, it was just like an air cooled system, um, and that and those vehicles had some battery issues um, with with regards to their, their lifespan when they were, where they were in extreme heat situations. So I, I believe that most all OEMs now have incorporated and engineered into their cars, um, heating and cooling systems for the battery pack. So it stays in the optimal, optimal zones that they want it to be in. And the, and the companies that also design and engineer and UL certify the charging station infrastructure, um, those DC power chargers are also thermally managed as well. So they last uh, the full time of service life that they're um, designed for. Thank you, David. Uh, Justin, I'm telling you, one day I'm going to extract all of David's information from his brain and be able to put it. <laughs> we'll be happy to, to, to get him a, a, a live video link to, to download all of his information. <laughs> I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm still learning every day. It's an amazing, it's an amazing industry and uh, I love being part of it. I agree. Uh, thank you, David, for joining us today. Uh, he's VP of Grant Operations at Blink Charging. Isaiah uh, Mao, thank you so much for joining us. Executive Vice President of Reef Charging. And uh, thank you to IPMI. Thank you, Justin and Rachel, for uh, giving us this forum and I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, just sorry, one final note. We we will. I see more questions in the chat. We will answer all of those offline. So, uh, Justin, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, I do want to say thank you very much for Blink for sponsoring today's Learning Lab. Um, Isaiah and Don, thank you for a great conversation. Um, we will provide a copy of today's session uh, within 48 hours um, after today's session, and we will we will post it on our website and then also on IPMI's YouTube channel. So again, thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.